OK, so I want to start by talking a little bit about why bother to study translation at all. So some of you may already know that's what you want to do. Some of you may still be considering your options and translation is one among a number of different things that you're thinking about doing for postgraduate study. So the the key point of, through all this is why does translation matter is that in a globalized world, which clearly we live in now, translation is kind of at the heart of the way everything works. As um, trade has become more globalized, and you know that's a trend that uh, continues, we have to talk to people across linguistic and cultural barriers, and translation is the key way, or one of the key ways that this happens. Um, as a consequence of that, demand for translators has continued to grow. You know, and it continues to grow quickly. So, for example, in the US, they recently did a big um, study. This was the US uh, Bureau for Labor Statistics, where they kind of assessed a whole load of different professions um, to think about how well they would cope over the next 10 years or so, whether they would shrink because of technological change and globalization, or whether they would grow. And they thought that translation and interpreting would continue to grow very, very quickly, much faster than the average for other occupations. So it's a safe area to go into in terms of a long career outlook. I should say as well, translation is about more than translation. So learning to translate, of course, is about learning advanced language skills and all of that. But it's also about learning in a really sophisticated way about intercultural exchange and how people from different backgrounds and different languages can communicate with one another, how communication can work and the kinds of challenges and opportunities that that raises. So, if you study translation, you can certainly go on to be a translator, but the I use the term language professional above because really it's the options are much broader than just being a translator. So now we there are lots of posts for localizers who don't just translate linguistically, but also kind of modify content on a larger scale to suit local audiences. Terminologists who work in large organizations uh, like the UN or big companies to ensure consistency of terminology across languages. That's a big and growing profession. Uh, proofreading is big, so not translating, but checking translations from other people, uh, removing errors, that kind of thing. Uh, post editing, which is where uh, translation itself is done by machines and then humans go through, clean it up, remove all the errors afterwards. That's a big uh, role as well. And trans creators as well. So again, it's kind of like localizing, but sort of localizing plus in a sense where uh, the language professional translates between the languages, but also creates new content as required. OK, um, so Dr. we Neil, can move on the to right, the next slide. If you try the right arrow. I don't think I can see it on, on this on occasion. But... Oh. oh. OK, it is letting me do it. OK, great, great, perfect. OK, so what will the MA actually provide you with? So the MA is really designed to do a few different things that it will give you a uh, deep knowledge in theory of the theory and practice of translation. So what we mean by this is you'll develop the skills to get good at kind of actually practically doing it and taking a text in one language and translating it into another language, but also that the understanding you'll develop will go deeper than this so that you really understand what you're doing why you're doing it, you're able to make really well thought through decisions and uh, crucially later if you become a language professional to justify the decisions that you make. OK, oh, I don't know, PowerPoint is not being friendly today, is it? OK, right. Uh, can we just go back one? I don't know. OK, it will prepare you to work as a language professional, so you'll have everything you need to go into one of the professions we spoke about earlier. You'll be kind of well equipped to do that, but it will also give you um, skills which are kind of can be applied more broadly, so you don't have to go into uh, into a job specifically as a language professional afterwards because you'll also develop just advanced critical thinking skills. So being able to read in a really kind of nuanced way pick through arguments, identify the flaws, identify the strengths, all that kind of thing, continuing to build on the sorts of skills you would have done at an undergraduate degree, but to a sort of higher level of sophistication. Um, 
which would be applicable more broadly. And also, if you want to go on to uh, further study, then the MA will set you up very nicely to go on to do a PhD afterwards. The big difference in structure between an MA and an undergraduate degree is there's a lot more kind of independent study in an MA. So we'll be guiding you, but we're there to support you in developing your own ideas much more. So we'll introduce you to lots of different concepts, we'll give you all the tools you need, and then we're there to help you kind of explore the areas that you want to explore so that you're much more in control of your own learning, which, you know, it's, uh, if you go on to PhD, it's, you'll just kind of continue along that trajectory. OK, so. Why is being awkward? OK. The course structure, the thing I really want to emphasize with this, again, if you're coming from an undergraduate degree, is that the MA is a full 12 month course. So the way it works is in the first semester, which runs September to January, you will do taught modules. So and we'll talk about modules more in a minute, but you will uh, you know, choose modules in an, uh, according to your own interests. And you'll, you know, you'll take classes, you'll write assignments. The second semester works in much the same way. You'll take classes, you'll write assignments. OK, that's pretty much the same as undergraduate. And then during the summer, when you would have been off <laughs> as an undergraduate, there's the third semester, which is the research led dissertation. So there's no classes during this period. Uh, so you don't have to physically be on campus, you know, so if you want to, you know, if you live in a different country or you just don't want to hang around in Belfast, that's absolutely fine. You can do it remotely. But what you will do is you'll work on an original research project for the three months of the summer, pretty much working in uh, collaboration with one of the members of academic staff who will be there to supervise you, guide you and support you through the whole thing. So the dissertation is 15,000 words long, which sounds like a lot, but don't worry, you're not on your own. And what tends to happen is everybody thinks that they don't have 15,000 words to say about anything in the world, but then actually they, they run out of words. Um, Sahar can maybe talk more about that soon because she recently did it. All right, let's talk a bit more about the um, specific modules. So some of the modules are compulsory, so everybody has to do them. So the big module that everyone has to do is the theory and practice of translation, which is really there to introduce you to the key concepts which we think that anyone studying translation needs to know. So these are key ideas from the field of translation studies as an academic discipline, but we're guided primarily by what we think you need as a translator, rather than because we're kind of really committed to one particular academic discipline. So that covers the theory part and then the practice element of that module uh, comes through language specific workshops, which we'll talk about more in a minute. The other big compulsory module is the business of translation, which everyone has to do. And what that is for is to teach you about the translation industry so that you really know what you need to do if you want to set up in business afterwards. So that covers it's not so much on practical skills, but things like how to deal effectively with clients, how to market yourself, how to find um, how to find work, all those kinds of things. Most people in the UK work as translators or freelancers, so it, it can be a bit daunting to just get started if you don't know about that. And I should say as well, the business of translation is taught by my colleague uh, Liam Quinn, who is not an academic. He runs his own translation agency, so it's not kind of us talking about something we don't know about. You know, it's, it, we really do have a specialist for that. The other compulsory element right at the end of the list is the dissertation. Everybody has to do that. Uh, there's no uh, way to avoid that. But the rest of the modules are all optional. So um, you, uh, you will choose a number of these depending on what you're interested in. And I won't go through them all now, but I'll just talk a bit about uh, the sorts of things that we cover in some of them. So. Meaning, sense and translation really looks at the theory of how meaning in language works. You know, what, what do we, what does it, how does language mean anything? Do, do words and phrases actually point to things directly in the world or is it all internal relations? And what does that mean for the way translation works? Translation and journalism looks at the varied roles that translation plays within journalism as an industry within the media more broadly. And we also look at journalism as a practice, as a kind of translation in its own right, which is concerned with the 
representation and transformation of um, kind of other things which are already meaningful. Technical translation looks at specific technical contexts, so uh, things like uh, legal translation, medical, uh, technical in the sense of uh, like uh, translating technical documents, which is a major, it's a major area of work if you go into the industry afterwards. Literary translation does what it says on the tin, so we look at novels, short stories, children's literature, poetry. Translation in digital contexts I teach, which looks at uh, mostly non-professional translation practices on the internet, so the kind of weird and wonderful things that people are doing out there, often unbeknownst to the translation professionals. Translation for performers uh, focuses on translation in the theatre and translating for the stage, so producing texts to be performed subsequently. The identity of the translator looks at ethics primarily. What does it actually mean to be a translator? What kind of responsibilities do we have? Who do we have those responsibilities to? Audiovisual translation looks mostly at subtitling, if you wanted to translate in that industry, but also at things like um, uh, dubbing, audio description, and a bit about accessibility for people with sensory impairments. Principles of community interpreting, finally, is um, not translation at all, it's interpreting, so it's oral. Um, and that will allow you to kind of gain an introduction to interpreting as a practice so that you'll develop some basic skills in doing that um, and be kind of ready to know if you want to study that further into the future. OK, so any specific uh, questions about if anyone wants any more detail about any of these modules, you can throw them in the chat here, but in many ways easier just to drop me an email so I can answer in a bit more detail. OK, so let's talk a bit more about the practical element. So every student, in addition to the modules I've just talked about, will also attend at least one two hour workshop a week in which they will work on practical translation in the sense of actually working with texts. So the modules I was talking about before, the kind of theoretical stuff, all the students from all the different language combinations are together. We do that on purpose because it really gives diverse classrooms, it gives diversity of opinion, and it really allows us to learn from one another. You know, so if you're if you're Irish, you'll be with people from the UK, from China, from the Middle East. You all work with different languages, and it's amazing how much you can learn about your own language and your own context by hearing about kind of other contexts and other languages. In the language specific workshops, on the other hand, we break you off into specific language pairs. So if you work with Spanish and English, you'll go to a workshop with everyone else just doing Spanish and English, Arabic and English, you know, Chinese and English, so on and so forth. You just feel that way, done that way. You'll look at a range of different text types. So we run these all through the year. So there's one a week for the full, both the taught semesters. And you'll work through a sort of a range of different texts. So you'll look at literary stuff, um, you'll look at technical stuff, um, promotional materials, advertising, all that kind of thing. But the key point here is that, you know, I, if it, I take the Arabic workshops, if I'm taking them, then I have a list of text types that I like to use and texts that I want to look at. But ultimately, it's kind of student led. So if there's something that you want to study, there's a sp something specifically you want to look at. If you tell the person who takes your workshop, you can almost certainly do it. And we'll talk more about this in a bit, but we really do try and be as adaptive to our students as we can. Okay. You can attend as many of these as you like. So everyone has to do at least one. But if you work with multiple languages and you want to go to more than one workshop, then that's absolutely fine. You know, and, and also it can be that if you have one main language, which is your strongest language, but you have another language which you're not quite as good at, but you'd still, you still like to work on it. These workshops can be quite a nice way to do that. So I know um, Sahar, who we'll talked to us later, did the Arabic workshop and also the, the French workshop. And some years we also, uh, we have people who do you know, three or more, depending on what languages they have. In terms of the languages we can offer for this, um, absolutely guaranteed is that there can be a workshop for French, Spanish, Polish, Russian, Chinese, German, and Arabic. We can nearly always provide other languages, but because the guaranteed languages are the languages that the permanent staff at the university can provide, we, we absolutely know we can get them. Other languages we can almost always get, 
but it's not guaranteed in quite the same way. So if you're concerned about that, um, contact me later and I can talk about it more. But in previous years, for example, we had students with Japanese, that was fine, Romanian, Italian, Irish, Basque, Portuguese, and so on. So we can nearly always find people. Uh, so the workshops are taught by academic staff if it's one of the languages that the staff have. If we don't have a language that you need, then we bring in professional translators to cover it. So you'll always have someone who really knows about the language you're working with, but also about translating with that language. OK, someone with that experience. Right. Mm -hmm. OK. Oh. So there's a bit of a lag on. OK, so I, I wanted to talk briefly about the way we try and do things um, uh, uh, at Queen's. So CTI is the Centre for Translation and Interpreting. That's what we are, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But really, everything we do, we ground in having staff which are accessible to you and supportive. So what that means in practice is that like we we don't have office hours. We don't have like one hour a week when each of the members of staff is available. Basically, if you need us during work hours, you get in contact with us and we are there to help you. If you want a meeting to talk about anything, it might be pastoral, it might be work related, it might be something in a class you just want to discuss further, you just drop us an email, whoever you want to speak to, and we'll arrange a meeting, you know, and we're available for you. That can feel strange. Some uh, students are not used to that, but that's really at the core of what that's, you know, at the heart of the way that we try and do things. And we see for us as staff really knowing our students as individuals and working closely with them is really, really important. And we think that's one of the most important things on the course. So, you know, do take advantage of that if you come. As Amani said, it's very research driven. So we're all researching these topics all the time and that's in the teaching that we do. So we're teaching things that we're also researching. So I research social media and media more broadly, and I teach on translation and journalism and translation digital context. It's it's stuff that we're working on, so you can be sure that what you're being taught is kind of up to you know bang up to date. And it's student focused in the sense that if things aren't working, you know every student cohort is different. We have different groups of people, different personalities, and we modify and we tweak the course each year to reflect that. You know we don't just kind of have a set model that we apply regardless. We really try and be as responsive as we can. In addition to all this, there's extra content. So we have a seminar every week during the taught semesters delivered by a visiting academic. Um, we have a mixture of kind of big names. If you're, if you've uh, done some, uh, if you've studied translation before, people like Mona Baker, Lawrence Fanuti, Christian Nord, Michael Cronin. We get these kind of people regularly and we intersperse them with um, kind of earlier career up and coming academics and practitioners in translation. So it means that you don't just have to listen to us all the time, you have a good sense of what's going on more broadly. We run one off workshops and events regularly throughout the year. There's no set program for these. They change every year. So recently we've done ones on you know, translation and music. Uh, video game localization and we also run an annual uh, visit to the European Commission. You have to pay for the European Commission visit, it's subsidized but just for travel and that sort of thing, but everything else is included, there's no extra cost for anything. We run skill development classes as well, so we have weekly academic writing and creative writing classes and you can also access uh, discounted, uh, discounted courses in the language center, so if you want to study another language you can do that very cheaply. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can go forward. Amani, can you take us forward? Not very good. And just to say as well that this um, is part of broader training and support which comes to the university. So these are just the categories of training courses provided by the graduate school that Amani mentioned earlier. So it's kind of you'll have a lot of support within translation and also there's a lot of support from outside as well. Okay, you take us forward again, Amani. I don't know why PowerPoint isn't playing ball. Thank you. 
So you'll be long to the to the center. It's not just you trapped on one program, but part of a larger center uh, for for research and teaching and translation interpreting. So six full time staff. We have about 25 to 30 MA translation students from all around the world. About 25 MA interpreting students, which is uh, they all work with Chinese and English. We have around 40 PhD researchers again from all around the world. And also, um, usually we have a kind of coming in and out, uh, visiting scholars and students from different countries, different universities who are attached to Queen's for a period of time. Let me just go forward again. Thank you. So I won't run through all this now, but you'll get the PowerPoint afterwards. This is just to give you a sense of the staff that we have working within the center and our main areas of interest. So where our kind of leader is Professor David Johnston. We have two senior lecturers, which are Dr. Piotr Pumczynski and Dr. Sue Ann Harding. And then we have three lecturers. So there's me, uh, Neil Sadler, there's Dr. Chen and Ho, and Dr. Kathleen Kess. So you'll find more about all of us if you're interested on our profiles on the Queen's website. Um, yeah, get in touch really. And if you want to know more, just uh, drop us an email. We'll be happy to talk about it. The final thing I want to say is that, um, as I said at the start, you can you can certainly become a translator if you do this course. Many of our graduates do do that. The ones that want to, many others go into PhD. We have lots who've gone through the MA, done a PhD, gone into academic careers. But people, uh, graduates have gone on to all kinds of other different careers as well. So we you have know, business development managers, uh, people in consulting, uh, alumni who've gone into the civil service, people who've become translators, but then set up their own translation agencies. Uh, the manager of the language center at Queens is a graduate of our program. Uh, we have a, a friend of mine, Hassan Belushi, who is now a lieutenant in the Omani army. So you, you can really go off in a lot of different directions about it, from this and without wasting the skills you've gained, you'll still be able to make use of them. OK. Right now, I hope Sah can jump in and tell us a little bit about um, what she's doing now and her experience on the program. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. OK, great. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sahar Othmani, and I was I am a very recent graduate of uh, Queens. I uh, started my MA in 2018, 19 ish, um, graduated this December. So I'm originally from uh, Tunisia and I currently live in Oman. And I'm here to kind of share some insider information about what it's like uh, being a student at Queens, being a Muslim student at Queens, and uh, particularly for the translation course. Um, so I hold a background like my BA is in uh, literature, so I wanted to uh, to get more um, specific per se. Uh, orientation towards translation, so I, I thought I would uh, go for Queens because of one of these um, webinars held by Dr. Neil, actually. So there you go. Um, so I I want to talk a little bit about the MA experience because uh, very often when we think of an of the MA um, in, in the Middle East, we think of something very theory focused. We think about uh, reading for tons of hours which might be partially true but it's not you know it doesn't cover the entire uh the entire realm of, of the ma experience so i did take uh the the obliga obligatory courses like uh, obviously the theory and practice and the business of translation but i did not expect them honestly to be so engaging you know, because uh, for example the business of translation course was uh was really interactive in a sense that um, it gave us real life experience. So Dr. Liam, as Dr. Neil has told you, um, actually all holds a translation um, agency. So he uh, he actually assigned us to real life companies based on our language pairs, and we were able to to kind of delve deep into the whole uh, translation in, in real life uh, situation. And we didn't really choose the topics. So basically it mimicked real life. So those, uh, this is for the uh, obligatory courses. As for the optional courses, uh, a part of me was kind of uh, 
concerned a little bit that I might lose uh, the creative writing element of, uh, of my studies or, or my interests in general, but I kind of ended up gaining even more because uh, as Dr. Ni has told you, uh, there are optional courses that you can take which includes a really, really lovely course uh, in creative writing uh, held by Dr. Uh, Suan, which kind of develops you more than just uh, a, a translator or a language learner, but also as, as an individual or human being or a thinker as well. Um, in addition to that, I kind of have just a few notes here to, to kind of not lose track because there's so much to talk about uh, about this experience. Um, I also was one of the people who took uh, part in more than just uh, one language workshop. So I did uh, Arabic with Dr. Neil and a few other classmates, and I did uh, French. Uh, the workshops prepare you uh, also for real life situations. So there is a wide variety of, uh, of texts, and it's not just um, texts that are related to, to an idealistic view of translation. So you get all types of, of, of work. So in French, for example, we once translated a manual on medical equipment because that's one of the things that translators do do at the end of the day. Um, we also uh, did some subtitling uh, for, for the workshops as well as uh, for the ABT course, which was very beneficial because right now I am working as, as a translator and content writer and I also do subtitling because uh, it seems like there is a very, very niche market for uh, for subtitling, uh, especially in the Gulf or the GCC region. Um, as for the experience of studying at Queens in general, um, I think it was really enriching because the community there, the least that could be said about it is that it's very, very welcoming. Uh, it helps you to thrive. It helps you to kind of grow not only as a researcher, but, but also as a human being. There is so much respect and there is so much open mindedness to to difference and there is so much acceptance to to your thought process. So very often uh, I, I started the MA immediately after graduating from my bachelor's degree. So I was kind of very uh, into the whole inside the box kind of thinking where I would be like, I'm very restricted to a certain realm of thoughts that I would not exceed or I would not go beyond. But I found myself encouraged by by my advisors, by all of the lecturers really, uh, to, to take that extra step or to go that extra mile. So there was literally, um, no judgment whatsoever to whatever idea it is that I had, as long as I was able to execute it and put it within an academic framework that could actually work. Um, the experience of studying at Queen's uh, is also very, um, it's a very delightful experience because although you're studying, you're also uh, growing as an individual who's uh, exposed to a completely different new culture. Um, you're practicing your second language, uh, which obviously is mine is English, uh, in its natural context or its natural culture. So if you think that uh, you are able to grow just by by learning courses in, in whatever it is that you specialize in, I'm telling you that you're in for a very big uh, surprise. Not only that, but uh, as Dr. Neil has mentioned, there are some language courses provided by the Language Center that I really recommend that people uh, make use of. So I had started um, self-learning Korean and I did not have a, a certification in it or a degree or anything. And it was something that I really wanted to pursue because I, I personally enjoy um, reading for, for that culture and I'm very interested in literary translation. Um, so I actually did go ahead and I signed up for an intermediate Korean course. I'm not going to show off or anything. I just want to show you that you do get like a little certification here um, that that proves that, oh, this person can actually speak this language that you can use that I've showed uh, to my current employer. And now I kind of do uh, on the side uh, translation jobs from and into, uh, well, from Korean, that is. So that's one thing. Um, another thing uh, is that, uh, as I've explained to you before, uh, the uh, the experience itself is very enriching that when you're thinking of uh, of pursuing a certain career, you're not just limited to, you know, doing a nine to five translator job. So uh, I ended up taking the 
community uh, interpreting course, and I found myself really interested in interpretation um, or interpreting. So right now, because or thanks to to that course and to the encouragement that I received from so many of my lecturers, um, I currently also work as a simultaneous uh, interpreter for conferences. So in a way, you think that you're going to graduate and do a certain job, but really the options are quite limitless. And on a final note before I conclude, uh, there was also a very, very interesting event that was held, and I, I really hope that it's held in the future, uh, which entailed uh, localization and, and, and game development, and there were opportunities for uh, for participants to, uh, sorry, to actually um, take take that path in the future. So not only did we attend an event, we were also able to kind of communicate with insiders, with people who work uh, as localizers, as game developers. So whatever it is that your your, your interest is, I think that, uh, and I'm not just, you know, bragging or just saying it for the sake of it, you will be able to pursue it and find yourself a set of new um, interests and passions. Uh, so I think that's, that's pretty much it for me. Uh, if there are any questions or anything like that, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. And on a final note to conclude, I really, really enjoyed studying at Queens that now I'm actually going back <laughs> for a PhD. So it, it works, it really does work. Um, and if it weren't for, for the encouragement and for the inviting environment for and for the prospects, um, I, I could have just chosen any other university, but I chose willingly to go back to Queens. So yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Thanks, Saha. Uh, we didn't even have to pay to say that. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'll just answer a few questions now that have come up in the chat. Um, where are we? Let's have a look. So Drew asked, what text or text does the theory and practice module follow, if any? So there's nothing like a textbook, and that's kind of that's one of the things when you move to postgraduate study is rather than working through a textbook, everything is designed bespoke for the specific courses that you're doing. So you will be given a reading list at the start to tell you what to read for each week and so you're prepared for, uh, for everything that comes. Uh, and we can certainly give that uh, to anyone who's interested so you can see the kind of content that we cover. Uh, Morgan asks, do we choose a language pair for the course? You don't have to officially choose or no. So you, for every assignment you write, they'll, for, for all the modules, you'll work with one language pair or another, but you don't have to like choose one language pair at the beginning and then stick with it all the way through. You know, you can work with whichever language pairs at any point that you like. That's completely your choice. Uh, will COVID-19 affect our school term? I'll ask Amani to respond to that one. <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I did. Can, can everyone hear me? OK. Yeah. OK, I um, I did type it in the chat box, but I'll just read it quickly. Um, now I know uh, the whole COVID-19 situation is uh, making it difficult and challenging for all of us, and I hope you're all keeping safe and well during these uh, very strange times. Um, but we actually just heard back from the university recently regarding um, the academic year and we're going to be treating the academic year as business as usual. So uh, it has been decided that we're going to continue uh, to plan to start our academic year um, on the same day that's published on the website, which is September 21st. But if um, September comes around and the situation persists uh, and we have to still do or apply social distancing measures, then we're, go we're actually going to look at delivering uh, potentially uh, online or um, we're going to be providing like teaching online via digital means like teams, for example, like what we're doing right now and other platforms as well. But for now, we are planning to commence our school year um, the same date that is published on our website, which is September 21st. But from now until then, we really don't know what's going to happen, but we do hope that things take a positive turn soon. Thank you, Amani, for that. Um, Alan, uh, tuition fees, uh, Abdurrahman, I think 
Gemma has responded, so there's a link in the chat to all the tuition fee information, and she'll talk about that more in a minute. And then Alan has asked, are students expected to have done much linguistic content in his or her degree in order to be suitable for the application? So the key thing here isn't whether you had a lot of linguistic content in your degree so much as whether you have advanced um, language skills and at least one other language. So you may have acquired that through doing an undergraduate degree in English or in French or whatever, but we also get students who learn their language skills in other ways. So, for example, we had a student a couple of years ago who just who was from the UK, he lived in French Canada for a long time and learned French that way. He had advanced French, he'd never studied it formally, but he had the level of language that was needed. So it's kind of flexible that way. It's not about kind of, it's not formal qualifications that are the main thing with that. Um, right, that's it for questions in the chat. Uh, Gemma, could you just finish up with the final section, please? Yes, okay. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to talk about entry requirements and fees and scholarships. So um, basically the academic requirements for entry to the course, you normally need a 2-1 honours degree or equivalent uh, qualification acceptable to the university. So I know we've got lots of students uh, here from many different countries worldwide. So if you want to see what the equivalent qualification is in your own country, if you go onto our internet, onto our website and click on international, you can choose your country from there. Uh, we'll post a link in the chat at the end so that you can uh, go directly into that. We will also consider, if you didn't quite meet the 2-1 the or equivalent, we'll also consider 2-2 entry if you have some experience, uh, relevant professional experience. And if your qualification is below a 2-2, if you have at least three years relevant experience will certainly consider you for entry to the program. Right, um, so English requirements, if you're an international student, uh, you would be required to um, have an English exam such as IELTS. Uh, so if it's IELTS that you've taken, it would be a score of 6.5 overall with no less than 5.5 in any of the four components. Um, we will also accept a wide range of other English language entry requirements uh, and we'll post a link on our uh, chat as well. But there's a wide range of qualifications that will also accept equivalent English. But there are two new ones that we've introduced for this year because of uh, IELTS centres being closed. So these are new additional to the ones that we normally uh, will accept. Uh, the first one is the Duolingo, Duolingo English test. Um, so basically, you can just go on to that link and do the exam yourself, and then you can send the results into the university. Uh, the university, Queen's, is also running some online English tests for sales, the password test. Uh, uh, basically, that is open to students who have already met the academic conditions for entry to the programme. So you have to have met the academic conditions for entry to be able to set that test online. Um, if you haven't been contacted about that, um, there's a link on our website that you can send a, an email to, but uh, we'll post that in the chat at the end as well. So how do you apply for the course? Basically, um, there's a number of ways, but if you're an international student, many international students would apply through an agent in their country. Uh, so we have many agents in different countries worldwide, and if, if you would like a list of those, uh, you can email our international office, um, which is international at qub.ac.uk, and we'll send you details of the agents that are in your country who can help with the application. If you're a local student, you can also apply directly on the website. Uh, there's an application button on the, the translation page itself, so it's an online application form there. So the fees basically uh, for home students, so for Northern Ireland and EU students outside of GB, so France, Italy and so on, uh, the fees for this coming year are £6,140. And if you're from GB, so England, Scotland or Wales, the fees are £6,900 for 2020 entry. Uh, just a couple of years ago, um, there was loans launched in the UK and in Northern Ireland for students who wanted to study at postgraduate level. Um, so they are tuition fee loans similar to the undergraduate loan that you would receive to do your undergraduate degree. So they're very low interest and you pay them back at the end of your undergraduate loan. Uh, so there's a link on the Queen's website to give you further details on those. 
So the international fees are 16,900, but you'd be glad to know that there are, there are a number of international scholarships on offer, uh, very generous scholarships. So the, the top one is the International Office Postgraduate Taught Scholarship, and that is a £2,000 fee discount if you meet the conditions of your offer, and that is an automatic scholarship that you do not need to apply for. Uh, you may also be able to avail of the Early Bird Award, which is a, a further 10% fee discount of the gross fee if you pay 90% of your fees by the stipulated date. Uh, we have just moved the deadline for Early Bird to the 15th of September to allow for students who are doing pre-sessional English to, uh, to be able to avail of that. Um, so if you pay, if you've met all the conditions of your offer, including academic and English, uh, and you pay 90% of your fees by the 15th of, of September, you will get a further 10% uh, discount of the fees. So that in conjunction with the International Office Scholarship uh, results in an overall discount of the 16,900 of 3,690. Uh, we are also offering a small number of vice chancellor scholarships, which are full fee scholarships. And just to let you know that you have to apply for that. Um, the deadline is the 12th of May and you must hold an offer for the course to apply. So if you're considering entry this year and you haven't yet applied and you're an international student, uh, I'd recommend you apply soon so that you hold an offer in time for that if you wish to apply for the full fee scholarship. And just to let any international uh, students who are currently uh, listening into this that are currently at Queen's, uh, you have a loyalty scholarship, so you would get 20% discount if you progress from undergraduate to postgraduate study uh, in translation at Queen's. Um, unfortunately, the above scholarships are not open to you, but, but that's the reason you get a 20% discount uh, as a loyalty scholarship. Right, uh, so that's everything to do with fees and scholarship. I think we're now going to take more questions in the chat box and we'll be posting some useful links there as well uh, to do with what I've just uh, talked about. So we're happy to take any further questions you may have. Thank you. Would you like to answer David's question, Gemma, when the fees, when they can start paying fees? Right, David, so um, you can you don't start paying your fees until you basically unless you avail of the early bird you would have paid your all of your fees by the 15th of september but after that there's a number of fee payment options so some people want to pay all of their fees up front other people pay them in installments throughout the year so different people want to pay their fees in different ways so you can pay uh, if you want to avail of the early bird and you're an international student that is but if you're a home student, you can pay your fees whenever you start the course or there are options to pay it over um, the full length of the program in uh, different installments. So I will put a link up to that on the chat. Let's see Morgan's question of translation and research topics at Queen's. So, I mean, really, as I said before, it depends on what you're interested in. So the kinds of topics that our MA students study or look at in their dissertations vary a great deal from year to year, depending on the interests of the students. So as it happens, I just have the list for this year's students. Uh, so we have people looking at identity and political conflict. So looking at translation in the IRA, uh, Chinese poetry, um, some are looking at bilingual literacy, another one at translation of Peking opera, uh, another looking at the translation of invented languages, so specifically the languages of Middle Earth in Tolkien's writing, um, minority language survival in the digital era, music ly lyric translation, and so on. Um, Saha looked at indirect literary translation, so when you translate via another language, so for example, English to Korean into Arabic and things like that. So it's really it's really up to what you would like to do. Uh, I think we've covered the deadline for application. Gemma, do you know about Tasneem's? About transferring? Uh, 
I can I can answer that question. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so uh, the question was, would I be able to transfer for a medicine course? I'm already at a medical school and I would like to transfer my clinical years. Um, unfortunately, Tasneem, um, our, our medicine program, we do not, uh, uh, we, we are unable to accept transfer of clinical years or even transfers of credits. And so for a student who wants to do medicine at QUB, you would have to apply and start from year one, uh, regardless of the clinical years and the courses you've taken in another location. Thank you. Um, and I can answer the next question by um, Ruji. Uh, Ruji um, if we take online class um, in the first semester, will the tuition fees be reduced? Now, we just uh, came up with the decision just a couple of days ago to start the school year in September as per what we've been um, announcing and what we've been talking about uh, the past few months. Um, and so we haven't changed the start date of our academic year. Now, if we have to um, start offering online and digital means of learning, uh, we would definitely be looking at uh, tuition fees and we would be measuring uh, if we would need to uh, reduce the fees. But as of now, unfortunately, I won't be able to answer that question because it's still early on. But closer to date, we would definitely have answers to those particular questions. For distance learning, no, it's not currently offered for distance learning. Um, classes and fees for part time students. So basically it's split in the middle. So you would do the course over twice the period of time. You pay the same fee overall, but kind of spread out more. The way classes work, so we 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 take a block teaching approach to teaching. So instead of having like an hour on Tuesday morning and then another hour on Wednesday afternoon, and then again at 10 on Thursday, we group classes together on Monday and Tuesday evenings. So pretty much all the classes run between four and eight o'clock, which is quite intense, but it's efficient uh, in terms of time. You don't have to keep coming in and out and it works well for part time students. Um, and then, yeah, the exact split of the number of hours you would need to do in each of the years of study would depend on the modules you chose and when they run. And you can still do as many language workshops as you like. The language workshops don't have fixed times that they run, so we arrange, we, <laughs> we negotiate a time each year depending on the specific participants. So, for example, if your language was French and English, then that would be taken into consideration if you were a part time student when choosing a time for the class to make sure that you could attend it. So that's how we deal with that. I know um, Claire also um, earlier asked a question about scholarships for international students, so I just kind of referred back to the PowerPoint presentation and I just put the slide up again, uh, Claire, for, for you to kind of see them. OK, Chloe, uh, French and Spanish for the MA, many opportunities in NI of these languages and just go further afield. Yeah, so that's another, that's a really interesting thing about the way the translation industry works. So in the past, you know, 20 years ago, your work would all be local, but now that's not how it works at all. So everything is completely Internet based. So where you are physically located as a translator doesn't really matter in terms of work opportunities at all. You, know, you can work for clients. Um, all, all over the world really easily and they probably won't even know where you're physically located. So yeah, that's, uh, you shouldn't worry about that. Um, Tasneem asked, uh, are there any summer medical courses or electives that would allow her as an international student to be exposed to the UK healthcare system? Now, um, we have the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Sciences at, at QUB and under that umbrella there are a uh, plethora, like so many different um, courses that you can tap into and we do have some summer subjects that are offered in this uh, summer uh, subjects that are offered. Um, these can be under, you know, the umbrella of nursing, midwifery, um, pharmacy and so on and so forth. And so what I can do after after uh, speaking right now is I'll send a link to the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Life Sciences and then you can kind of get an idea of what are the different subjects and courses that are offered under that umbrella. So Ellen uh, accepted place in September, study Irish and with one of the guaranteed languages. Yeah, that should be absolutely possible. So as I said, the guaranteed languages there, absolutely. Irish 
I'm 99% sure it will be there. So we're running Irish this year. We ran Irish last year. We ran it the year before without any difficulty. I'm almost certain it will run again um, next year. Yeah. Any final questions from anyone? You're welcome. So as I said before, with the translating sacred text, so the modules, the theoretical modules are not language specific. So um, they, you, you, you can use any language you like in those because you'll be with students with other language combinations. In terms of the language specific workshops, you can certainly look at sacred texts as one of the text types that you explore. Um, and again, then the language availability just depends on the specific language that you're choosing. If it's one of our guaranteed languages, yes, definitely. If it's one of the other languages, uh, probably yes. Can I study Greek combined with English? Um, I have to say Greek is one we've struggled with before. So I will certainly do our best to get a Greek tutor, but it's not, um, it's not guaranteed. You're welcome. Anything else at last? OK, then I think we can wrap up there. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's nice to meet you all, even if it's virtually. I've put my contact details there on the final slide, so really do feel free to drop me an email if you have any more queries or you just want to find out more about any of these different things. Um, and you can also follow us on Twitter, which is quite a nice way, I think, to get a sense of what happens in the centre normally, what kind of things we do uh, and just what the atmosphere is like anyway. So do consider following us there if you want to know a bit more about it. Thank you to Amani, Gemma and Sahar for your contributions. And that's it. Sign off now. Then. Thank you very much, everyone.